Hello, my name is Ron Zagoria, and I'm a radiologist at UCSF, and I'm the section chief of the abdominal imaging section. And I'm here to give a lecture on the imaging of renal masses, and I greatly appreciate your interest in this material. I do have a financial disclosure. I am a paid consultant for Recor Medical, a medical device development company here in California. Um, just to start out, I have some important renal cell carcinoma facts that really influence the, our diagnosis and surveillance of renal masses using imaging. Uh, this is all well known to you as urologists and other interested parties, but almost all renal cell carcinomas grow slowly. Uh, there are occasional very aggressive tumors, but on the average, these grow about two millimeters per year. Renal cell carcinomas that are smaller than three centimeters almost never metastasize, and especially after the initial detection, that being that there are some very aggressive renal cell carcinomas that present with metastases, even though the primary tumor is smaller than three centimeters. That's uncommon, but it's exceptionally uncommon for other tumors to grow to larger than three centimeters uh, before to metastasize before they've grown to that size. Uh, biopsy and surveillance imaging are certainly have become much more important in the imaging of renal tumors. I'll talk about those as I go along. When I talk about imaging of renal masses, it really involves both detection and then characterization. Detection, obviously, just finding that there's a mass there, and then characterizing it. Is it benign? Is it a cyst? Is it a solid renal tumor, likely a renal cell carcinoma or not? So let's talk briefly about detection. Uh, this is not quite as fun as the characterization, but it's obviously very important. So this material is a little bit old, but this was a great study done at the National Cancer Institute. And I think these numbers are still pretty valid. They used state-of-the-art ultrasound in a large patient population who had von Hippel-Lindau disease, who then went on to surgical confirmation of their masses. And they found that using ultrasound, their ability to detect small renal tumors was excellent for tumors bigger than 25 millimeters. Once they got smaller than 25 millimeters, the, the rate of detection, even with top quality ultrasound, dropped off quite rapidly. So once you get down to the 15 millimeter to two centimeter range, almost 50% of the renal tumors are undetectable with ultrasound. Whereas with CT, uh, even tiny masses with multi-detector CT are detectable. One millimeter, two millimeter cysts and small renal cell carcinomas can be detected. This was with uh, single slice CT, nowadays multi-detector CT and MRI, we can detect virtually every renal tumor if you use good technique. What about ultrasound? Well, renal cell carcinoma has variable features with ultrasound. It can appear solid or cystic. It can be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Uh, they're generally ball-shaped masses, spherical masses. But remember, for small renal tumors, a negative ultrasound does not exclude the presence of a mass, with, in this case, small being less than 2.5 centimeters. So let me show you an example of this. This was a very high-quality ultrasound done in a patient with hematuria. We did video clips. We looked at this carefully, even in retrospect. And this is the upper pole of the right kidney. It's very well demonstrated. No renal mass was detected. This CT scan was done one day later. And there is, in fact, a two centimeter solid and cystic mass in the upper pole of that right kidney that was proven to be a renal cell carcinoma. Again, this just confirms that finding by the National Cancer Institute study that small renal tumors are sometimes undetectable. And again, smaller than 2.5 centimeters. So if you have a patient who has hematuria or you have a high uh, index of suspicion for a renal tumor, ultrasound doesn't exclude small renal tumors, and you'll need to go to CT or MRI if possible. Other important thing about ultrasound is that about a third of small renal tumors, and again, in this case, it's three centimeters or smaller, about a third of them are hyperechoic. The significance of that is that hyperechoic is usually thought to represent an angiomyelipoma, but in fact, quite a few small renal cell carcinomas are also hyperechoic on ultrasound and indistinguishable from an angiomyelopoma using ultrasound alone. There is no ultrasound feature that can distinguish an angiomyelopoma from a small renal cell carcinoma. In those cases, if you see a hyperechoic small renal mass, do not assume it's an angiomyelopoma. You need to get CT or MRI at least once to see if there's detectable fat in the mass. 
to make the diagnosis of angiomyelopoma. Otherwise, it could very well be a renal cell carcinoma. So here's an illustrative example. These images go vertically with the ultrasound on top. Here's a hyperechoic renal mass, could be an angiomyelopoma, could be a renal cell carcinoma. Here's a non-contrast CT. We see this very black lesion that matches the density of the perinephric fat. This is a fat-containing mass diagnostic of angiomyelopoma. Here's a very similar hyperechoic mass in the upper pole of the left kidney. Here's a contrast-enhanced CT, no fat in this mass. This was, in fact, a renal cell carcinoma. Again, by ultrasound, indistinguishable, must get CT to look for fat and confirm a diagnosis of angiomyelopoma. Otherwise, assume that it is likely a renal cell carcinoma. Uh, other things to remember about the detection of renal tumors, other than that ultrasound is not very good for very small renal tumors, CT and MRI are much, much better. And again, virtually every renal tumor can be detected by high quality CT or MRI. When you suspect renal cell carcinoma though, it's important that you do good technique. A standard CT scan of the abdomen is done at a certain phase of contrast enhancement, the time after we start the injection of contrast, and it's not ideal for the detection of renal cell carcinomas. In that case, we need to do a, a scan tailored to looking for renal tumors, including some delayed phase scanning. So let me give you an example of that. This patient has a small renal cell carcinoma. This is a scan do, done during the corticomedullary phase, which is the typical time that we do our screening abdomen exams or routine abdomen exams. Those are usually timed to optimize imaging of the liver where also the phase of the exam makes a great difference. But that's not the ideal time to find renal tumors. So in fact, there is a small hypervascular mass here in the medulla of this right kidney that turned out to be a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. If we wait just a short time, this is about two minutes after the initiation of contrast injection. This is 60 seconds after the initiation. We see this mass very clearly as a defect in the nephrogram, clearly a mass that enhanced avidly and then washed out in comparison to the renal parenchyma. And again, this is a renal cell carcinoma. So it, I'm not the only person who knows this. Early on when multi-detector CT came out, which made it much quicker and easier to do multi-phase scanning, we quickly learned that we were missing quite a few masses. Up to 66% more small renal tumors were detected in the nephrogram phase. So that's just slightly later, but a more homogeneous enhancement of the kidney than during the corticomedullary phase, which again, is the routine phase for scanning the abdomen when we're not looking for a renal tumor, when it's just someone with abdominal pain, liver disease, a trauma, we don't typically do this slightly later scan. But in cases where patients have hematuria or you're looking for a renal tumor specifically, we, we can tailor the exam for this result. Excretory phase, as you see in a CT urogram, is also effective. So this patient also has a small renal cell carcinoma, virtually undetectable on this corticomedullary phase. Here's an excretory phase. And again, we see this almost two centimeter mass, which is washed out, which was hiding here in the medulla is a very vascular mass. Again, a biopsy and ablation proven clear cell renal cell carcinoma. This is not just about small renal tumors. It could be larger renal tumors. This was a scan that was sent uh, with a patient from an outside facility with this obvious renal cell carcinoma rising from the lower pole of the left kidney. He was sent in for a partial nephrectomy. Uh, in examining this patient, we got concerned about this other area here, which was not detected by the original radiologist or, or urologist. So we repeated the scan with a CT urogram technique. And here we see that area, which we were suspicious about, does in fact turn out to be a two and a half centimeter renal cell carcinoma that altered the uh, uh, surgical approach for treating this patient. So very important to do the technique right when you're trying to detect renal cell carcinomas. With MRI, it's much easier because we automatically get multi-phase imaging after we inject the gadolinium contrast material. Uh, it's important to do good technique, thin section, 3D, spoiled gradient acquisition or something similar. Different vendors have different names for these. Uh, we use Vibe, which is GE, Lava is uh, Siemens, and I think Fame is Philips, but they're all very uh, fast T1 weighted sequences where we get 3D imaging and get high quality images of the kidneys. So once we detect a mass, then we need to go on the characterization. I'll show you many pictures so you'll get the idea of what this looks like. But it's actually, I, this will come off as being very simplified, but there are a lot of nuances to this. And this is a 
proven technique. If you look at the shape of the mass, the composition, what it's made of, and where it looks like it arose, the epicenter of that mass, you will make the diagnosis, make the correct diagnosis in an extremely high percentage of these cases. So what are the shapes? Well, basically we try to characterize these, categorize these into two different categories. Either they're shaped like a ball, being spherical, usually exophytic, usually very well circumscribed, or a bean-shaped mass, which means that not that the mass is bean-shaped, but the mass grows in an infiltrative growth pattern that maintains the bean shape of the kidney. It is not usually exophytic and usually is ill-defined. So tumefactive growth makes a ball-shaped mass. These are round, well-circumscribed, often distorts the kidney shape if they grow out uh, beyond the kidney capsule or into the renal sinus. The infiltrative growth pattern may enlarge a segment of the kidney, but basically maintains the shape of the kidney, and these are ill-defined masses. So here's a, a diagrammatic appearance, ball-shaped mass, basically a spherical mass, very, tend to be very exophytic, usually very well circumscribed, versus an infiltrative mass, which grows along the lattice work of the renal parenchyma and may enlarge slightly that area, but basically maintains the reniform shape of the kidney. Here's an unfortunate individual, has both shapes of mass on one CT slice. So here's a renal cell carcinoma, an exophytic, spherical ball-shaped mass that's uh, easily definable. You can see the edges of this all around. This is a renal, a typical renal cell carcinoma. Alternatively, here's a mass where the epicenter is in the renal sinus. It's infiltrating the kidney, distorting it a little bit, but this is a bean-shaped mass that has infiltrated the kidney. And again, it's epicenter to the renal sinus. This is a urothelial carcinoma. It's a transitional cell carcinoma. Ball-shaped masses are really the, the main masses that we think about when we're talking about renal masses. They're the common things, renal cysts, renal cell carcinomas, angiomyolipomas, oncocytomas, and then slightly less common cystic nephromas, and then the rarer lesions that uh, we don't see very commonly. I'll show you examples of all these. So we look at the shape of the mass. Is it ball or bean-shaped? If it's a ball, then we classify it as one of the following based on its composition. Is it cystic? Not necessarily a simple cyst, but is it cystic? Does it contain macroscopic fat? If it's not a cyst and it doesn't contain fat and it's enhancing, then it is highly likely, about 90% likely, that it's a renal cell carcinoma. And then some masses are either too small to characterize or have con confounding factors that make them indeterminate. But I'd say those are quite uncommon that we can't come up with at least our best bet of what this renal mass is. So let me digress a little bit and talk about cystic lesions. So one thing about cystic tumors is you may have only CT imaging without contrast. This started to be very common when we discovered CT was great for diagnosing stone, and we started with a CT stone study, non-contrast CT through the abdomen and pelvis. And an early problem we encountered was, what do you do when you see a water density lesion in the renal parenchyma, but all you have is a non-contrast scan? Couldn't that be a cystic renal cell carcinoma? Well, it, it's feasible, but in large studies, what we've learned is if on non-contrast CT, that's all you have, if you see a water density mass, and they're pretty subtle, but you can detect them, that's 20 Hounsfield, less than 20 Hounsfield units, and homogeneous, then we can safely call that a benign simple cyst without any additional workup, regardless of its size. We've known for quite a while that if it's greater than 70 Hounsfield units, then it's a hemorrhagic cyst, and we can call that just a benign hyperdense cyst, meaning it's an old hemorrhage or with protonaceous material or other high density material, but it's benign. Unfortunately, there are quite a few that are gonna end up in the 20 to 70 range and are or that are heterogeneous, and those are indeterminate and have a risk of being a renal cell carcinoma. Here's an example of MRI scans on, on two patients, a CT scan and an MRI subtracted image. There's a mass here that's slightly higher than water density. And we see after contrast, this says enhanced, uh, not much more than the kidney, but definitely not a simple cyst. Whereas this one that's 25, 75 pounds filled units, we would call that a hyperdense cyst, a benign cyst. And we see on the subtracted image, this has no enhancement. This slight rim that looks like enhancement is just misregistration artifact because of slight changes in respiration during the scans. But remember, there are masses that are indeterminate. They fall into that danger zone. They're above 20 and less than 70 Hounsfield units, and those are basically too small to characterize, but they could represent 
renal cell carcinomas. Here's a patient who has one that's not 70. It is high density, but not that high, and it's greater than 20. And we see four years later, this patient came back, and this turned out to be a papillary renal cell carcinoma. And you will see this one grew quite a bit faster than two millimeters a year, and that's exceptional, but we see that on occasion. But this was a warning sign that this could be a renal cell carcinoma and led to surveillance imaging. What if the composition's cystic, but it's not a simple cyst? Well, typically we use a, a classification called the Bosniak classification, named after Morton Bosniak at NYU. And it's, I'll explain that in some detail, but it's extremely helpful in organizing your thoughts and determining the risk of it being a malignancy versus a benign tumor. Sometimes it's hard to tell, is it a cyst or not? Uh, just because it's very small. If it's greater than a centimeter and you're not sure, you can usually use ultrasound unless the patient is very large or has strange anatomy. Um, in those cases, you may just get thin cut CT and that can resolve whether it's solid or cystic. Or if it's very small and you really can't tell by your eyeball looking at it or other means, then you have to use MR if you're concerned about that. Show, so I'll show you some examples. This is an older CT, but this looks like a cystic mass. But is it a simple cyst or is this solid tissue here? Well, this is about three centimeters in size. So this could be evaluated with ultrasound, which it was. And we see with ultrasound, multiple septations in this mass, which we couldn't see by CT. And here's a solid nodule of, of tissue making this a Bosniak 4 lesion. This was a renal cell carcinoma. So again, larger lesions when in doubt. Ultrasound is fantastic. It's showing the internal architecture of cystic lesions and can determine if they're solid components. And now with uh, contrast agents for ultrasound, we can see if there's vascularity to these internal components to help classify them even more accurately. Here's a small mass on a CT. This is a little uh, around one centimeter in diameter, but these are very thick slices on this. These are five millimeter slices. Typically we get 2.5 millimeter or 1.25 millimeters or somewhere in that range. So in this case, we just asked the technologist to reconstruct the images with thinner slices. Here's a 1.25 millimeter thick slice. And now we can see this is clearly just a water density lesion, unlike here where this looked like a solid lesion with some enhancement in it. That's just due to volume averaging because the slices are too thick. So we can sometimes resolve these CT problems with just thinner slices made from the CT. The Bosniak classification, it's been around for probably 15 or 20 years. Um, much of it was really just observational and only recently has it been updated with more evidence-based uh, changes to make it a little bit more reliable. But Bosniak 1 and 2 are generally considered to be about 100% benign lesions. Bosniak 2Fs means we're not sure. There's a very small risk of them being malignant, but it's possible, and they recommend follow-up, thus the F for these lesions. Threes and fours are generally considered to be more likely to be malignant. Threes are about 50% malignant. Fours are about 90% renal cell carcinomas. And the key thing that makes a lesion a four is an enhancing solid nodule, solid component. I'll show you examples of all these. Just recently in 2019, radiologists updated the Bosniak classification, again, to a little bit more better define what constituted these lesions. So simple cysts, it's not only just what we call simple cysts, it's well-defined. Hounsfield units on non-contrast CT ranging from minus nine to less than 20 Hounsfield units. There should not be any enhancing components within that. Two, you can see this our features were already know thin sept are okay. If it's greater than 70 Hounsfield units of non contra CT, then it's a hyperdense benign cyst or non enhancing mass, meaning a hemorrhagic cyst, but didn't quite reach the 70 range, whether or not it has calcification. And they allow up to 30 Hounsfield units or 29 Hounsfield units, I should say, on a contrast enhanced CT because the measurements are a little bit less reliable after you've given contrast due to some beam hardening artifact or just lesions that look dark, but are just too small to characterize. We just, we know those are benign lesions. Um, they also recategorize the multilocular cystic mass as a 2F rather than a 3, and anything that has three millimeter wall or thin septa, then that also is a 2F. Whereas once we get into the threes and fours, these are more malignant. And you can look at these slides in more detail at your leisure. I'm not gonna go into great detail. Similarly, with the new classification, they determined that calcifications really don't matter in determining what level of 
a Bosniak classification they are. It used to determine uh, very densely calcified lesions got into the needs treatment zone, whereas others were considered risky, but uh, not highly determinant of malignancy. Now they really don't matter unless they're so dense that they obscure your ability to determine whether there's enhancement or not within the internal structures. In those cases, then uh, basically they make it a 2F, which requires then an MRI or other test to see through the calcifications, basically to see what's going on. Interestingly, uh, the Bosnian classification has also been extended to MR, and again, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but you can read through this or look at the original article, which was published in 2019 in the journal Radiology. Uh, this may be interesting to you because as urologists, you may see this language, so this new updated version also recommended language that we could use in our dictations. So one and two, basically, we would say these are benign, requiring no follow-up. Uh, whereas threes and fours, we'd say, you know, there's intermediate or high probability of these being malignant and consider a urology consultation, or we'd recommend a urology consultation, and then we recommend follow-up of others initially at six months just to gauge whether it's an aggressively growing lesion. If not, then we recommend one year annually out to five years to determine stability in the lesion, and after five years, if they were stable, we would determine these are benign. So some important examples. Here we see a similar, slightly higher than water density, but subtly lesion here. With contrast, we see there's an enhancing nodule. It's greater than four millimeters. There's also a septum here. But this enhancing nodule raises this up to a Bosniak 4 lesion, and 90% of these are renal cell carcinomas. Uh, here's an MRS uh, also showing a Bosniak 4 lesion. Here's a T2 bright lesion. Really can't tell much about it. It's heterogeneous, probably has some blood in there. With contrast on the T1 weighted image, we see that all of this dark material is just non-enhancing, but there is this uh, larger nodule of solid tissue with avid enhancement, and this is a Bosniak 4, and this was a renal cell carcinoma. Again, 90% of these are renal cell carcinomas. MRI can be very helpful, particularly for Bosniak 3s, I think, or if you're not sure whether there's enhancement or not. Bosniak 3 can have a solid non-enhancing component, but 3s generally are recommended to go to treatment, but sometimes we can avoid treatment. Like here, we see two sets of T1-weighted images. This uh, water is usually dark. Here we see white fluid in this mass, very bright, that indicates hemorrhage. And then there's this solid material layering posteriorly. But when we give contrast and looked at a subtracted image where we've subtracted out the baseline from the enhancement, so all that's left is what's enhanced with the gadolinium, we see there's zero enhancement in this. This is just a hemorrhagic cyst with a large clot here. And this is a totally benign lesion. So we would convert this from a three to a 2F and follow this sequentially to make sure that it does regress and doesn't is not hiding a component of renal cell carcinoma in there. So summarizing some of the key points about diagnosing cystic tumors, a non-contrast CT alone, if you have a lesion that's 20 to 70 hounds of units or, or heterogeneous on the non-contrast, then that's possibly a renal cell carcinoma. And in those cases, they should get further imaging or surveillance imaging to make sure they're not renal cell carcinomas or to proceed with managing them as renal cell carcinomas. Uh, classify complex cysts using the Bosnia classification system, particularly the new classification system, which is slightly more definitive and organized with better uh, guidelines for which categorization category to put lesions. MRI is very helpful for renal tumors for patients who can tolerate MRI uh, lesions that are 2F. If you're not sure where, whether they're 2F, many of these we will either upgrade or downgrade, at least get them out of the surveillance imaging. Threes, again, some of those threes can be downgraded so that they don't need treatment and rather than three be 2F or lower. And then lesions that are equivocal fours, which generally will all get treated when the patient can tolerate that. Uh, MRI may be helpful to confirm that in fact they are Bosniak 4s and not something lower or something different. Okay, let's move on. So now we want to look at uh, ball-shaped masses. Again, we're thinking renal cell carcinoma, cysts, and other solid masses of the renal parenchyma. But in this case, what if the lesion possibly has fat in it? Well, then we should be thinking about an angiomyelopoma. And remember, all hyperechoic masses in ultrasound need a CT, just not the tiny dots of hyperechogenicity. Those are generally old sites of infection, but if you see something a centimeter or more, 
those should get ACT or MR once to confirm the presence of fat. If there's no fat there, you're going to have to presume that they're likely renal cell carcinomas. Angiomyelipomas, 95% of them have fat in them. How do you detect that? Well, the best technique is really a non-contrast, thin sliced CT. Fat will stand out very clearly separate from the renal parenchyma. Fat is obvious on non-contrast CT. MRI is also useful, although I find CT is easier to discern tiny bits of fat, but with and without fat saturation, that's how you determine whether there's macroscopic fat. Again, the defining imaging feature of angiomyelipomas is macroscopic fat. Um, so angiomyelipomas, you must demonstrate fat to make the diagnosis unless you have a biopsy. Uh, even a tiny focus of fat indicates it's an angiomyelipoma in almost every case. And remember, hemorrhage is common in larger AMLs. There's a four centimeter rule. So when they get above four centimeters, the risk of spontaneous hemorrhage goes up significantly for patients with angiomyelipomas. Here's a patient with tuberous sclerosis where basically all you can see are fatty tumors in the renal fossa. And this one has acute hemorrhage, just uh, hyperdense material is acute blood clot from bleeding of one of these large angiomyelipomas. So this is an exceptional case, but there are cases where most cases, the angiomyelipomas are much smaller. And this is, slide is to illustrate how non-contrast CT is very helpful in differentiating, in di diagnosing fat, and also in differentiating cysts from angiomyelipomas. I find for small lesions, if there's only a tiny bit of fat or cystic fluid, it can be quite difficult once you've given contrast to tell how dark the lesion is. And I don't think the Hounsfield unit measurements when for tiny lesions in a contrast enhanced CT are very useful. So here we see a non-contrast CT of the left kidney. And this is another patient with tuberous sclerosis with many tiny fat containing tumors, but the fat really jumps out and stands out completely different than the water density renal parenchyma. Versus this lesion, there's a little tiny cyst here. And I only know that because I've looked at the contrast enhanced CT, but often again, particularly on thin slice CT, Fat and water can be very difficult to differentiate on it if you only have the contrast CT. But here, I'm positive that's not fat. This is what fat looks like. This is basically almost imperceptible, being a small collection of fluid in the, in the cyst. With MRI, uh, without fat saturation, fat will be quite bright on both T1 and T2 weighted sequences. Again, it'll match the appearance of the perinephric fat. So here we see an exophytic ball-shaped mass, with T1 bright material in the, in the midst of this mass. And then we do fat saturation, which makes the fat look dark. You can see the perinephric fat has gotten dark and those areas that were white have become dark. When we see bright areas in T1, it can be fat, it can be contrast, it can be blood. Uh, when we do the fat saturation, if that white becomes dark, it's only, it can only be fat. Uh, here's an example of a tiny angiomyelipum. Again, with contrast, it's hard to tell, is that fat? I'd probably think that wasn't fat, that it looks like a little cyst to me. Same, same mass on MRI, and you can see on this T1 weighted uh, image without fat, fat saturation, I know that because the perinephric fat is bright, but there's white, a bright spot within this renal mass that is fat. And I know it's fat because with fat saturation, it, the, the white becomes dark, and we see the same, it matches the perinephric fat. So this is a confirmation that this is macroscopic fat indicating that it's an angiomyelipoma. These are sometimes very difficult, but making this diagnosis is crucial because you can avoid unnecessary treatment of a benign tumor in many cases. So here's a case that I saw a few years ago. This is a patient who was sent in with outside scans, solid, enhancing, ball-shaped mass. It's endophytic, but clearly this is spherical. It doesn't seem to have any fat in it. It's not a cyst and it enhances. So this should be a renal cell carcinoma. But these are very thick slices. And for some reason, we rescanned the patient before the nephrectomy and we got thin slices. And on one millimeter thick slices, it looks a little different. There's that dot there that looks about as dark as the perinephric fat. And remember, this is a non-contrast CT. There's no way that's water density. It could be noise is possible. But we were very concerned and thought this was likely fat. So rather than this going directly to surgery, we biopsied this mass with percutaneous uh, image guided biopsy. And this turned out to be an angiomyelipoma. And of course, there's a definitive histochemical marker of angiomyelipomas uh, that is 
very, very reliable and again, can definitively make the diagnosis as in this case. So this patient went to observation, surveillance imaging, and never needed surgery up to this date for this angiomyolipoma. So it's really important to search for fat in renal tumors. I think thin slices are quite important in diagnosing renal tumors to uh, avoid uh, you know, overlooking these tiny bits of fat, which can sometimes be all the fat you'll see in an angiomyolipoma. So we know that fat in a kidney tumor almost always, 99% or more of the time, indicate it is benign. It's an angiomyolipoma. But don't forget, sometimes you'll see a mass that has both fat and calcification. In that case, the fat over the calcifications override the fat, and you should know that this could be a renal cell carcinoma. Not all of these will be, but more than half of them will be renal cell carcinomas. So here's such an example. Here's a mass that obviously in this non-contrast phase has lots of calcifications, but also within this mass is a globule of fat, non-contrast scan, no way. This is water density, this is fat. There's no question that is fat. And there were a few little globules like this of fat floating in the fluid. And there's a lot of frondy material. This looks funny for an angiomyolipoma, but they sometimes look funny. But the calcification overrides the fat. And we presumed that this was a renal cell carcinoma. This was in fact resected. And this turned out to be a papillary renal cell carcinoma. And that's typically what these masses are that have both, both calcifications and fat. But remember, some fat-containing masses, if they contain calcification, are renal cell carcinomas. A few things just remember, not all angiomyolipomas contain macroscopic fat. So 5% don't, and they're the so-called fat-poor AML, FP AMLs. But that's only 5%. Again, these are not super common tumors. And so 5% of not that common a tumor is a very small number. And in fact, I looked at a study where we biopsied uh, I think 300 renal tumors that were scheduled for ablation. And they were scheduled because they did not have macroscopic fat. They looked like renal cell carcinomas. And in fact, 1% of these turned out to be angiomyolipomas. That was 1% in total turned out to be definitively benign masses being angiomyolipomas. And in fact, there were 90 renal cell carcinomas for every one fat poor angiomyolipoma. So it's not perfect, but the, if you don't see fat in a real tumor, it's extremely unlikely it's going to be an angiomyolipoma, but it can happen. A renal cell carcinoma I want to talk about. Here's a gross specimen of a, a renal cell carcinoma, clear cell carcinoma in the upper pole of this kidney. So in this case, these are ball shaped typically. The composition is enhancing and no fat. It's not a simple cyst. So these are highly likely to be renal cell carcinomas regardless of size. So here's a typical example. Here's a lesion, a little hyperdense. Uh, they're sometimes isodense, sometimes less dense, sometimes more dense, but it starts out at 45 pound cell units. Uh, it enhances. So what is enhancement? Well, there's always some noise possible in scans. So what we determine is if it's greater than 20 pound cell units difference, then we call that enhancement. If it's 10 to 20 pound cell units, then that's equivocal. We're not sure if it's enhancing or whether that's noise. If it's less than 10, we do not we assume that is not enhancement. And if there's any difference, it's all just noise. So greater than 20 difference. So here we've got almost 60 difference and they could be either enhancement or de-enhancement. So not only did this enhance almost 60 Hounsfield units, it also de-enhanced 21 Hounsfield units, which is indicative of this is a renal cell carcinoma. So enhancement or de-enhancement of greater than 20 Hounsfield units. MRI, we don't usually use numerical measures, although percentages can be used greater than 15% enhancement uh, is usually considered real enhancement, it, assuming that all the other parameters of the scan are the same, but usually it's just done visually. So here we see a ball-shaped mass, a large mass in the lower pole of the left kidney. This thing obviously enhances as does the kidney, and this is a renal cell carcinoma. Some uh, other problem areas you mentioned, well, I talked about fat poor AMLs, there's no diagnostic imaging feature, but if you think something could be an angiomyolipoma, someone has tuber sclerosis or some other features like it's very exophytic kind of mushroom shape, it's hyper dense on pre-contrast, those are worrisome signs uh, that it could be an angiomyolipoma. Strongly consider biopsying those because they may, may in fact be a fat poor angiomyolipoma, but remember those are not very common. Multilocular cystic masses and oncocytic masses. Multilocular cystic masses, uh, basically, we 
can't make a definitive diagnosis unless we see solid enhancing components. And about 50% of those will be malignant and about 50% will be cystic nephromas and totally benign, but there's no imaging feature that's diagnostic. And oncocytic masses, I'll talk a little bit more about. So when you see a multilocular cystic mass, meaning more than four septations that are thin, not nodular, no solid enhancing components. The differential diagnostic basically includes cystic renal cell carcinoma, which tend to be very unaggressive, rarely, if ever, metastasized, cystic nephroma, and then some other very uncommon uh, lesions that can have that appearance, localized XGP, localized renal cystic disease, or abscess. So I've seen all of these that mimic a cystic renal cell carcinoma. But basically, we can't tell them apart. And here's an, an illustrative example. Here's a large, multilocular cystic mass septations on this T2 weighted image, no solid components. And here's a smaller lesion, which after contrast, we can see there are multiple septations, a little blurry, but this was a multilocular cystic mass. This was very small, neither had solid enhancing components. This was resected, was a cystic nephroma. This was biopsied and ablated. This was a renal cell carcinoma. The bottom line is we can't tell these apart and you have to either do surveillance imaging to wait and see if more aggressive features develop or if they grow, then that's a sign that they're more likely to be a malignancy than a cystic nephroma. But uh, no imaging feature is definitive for these. Oncocytomas, these are also a problem. Uh, the imaging features of these being solid, enhancing, spherical masses, not cysts, don't contain fat. So these mimic renal cell carcinomas. And these are the most common of the mimickers. About 9 or 10% of solid enhancing renal masses will be oncocytomas. And they make up the vast majority of our mistakes in diagnosing renal cell carcinoma. Um, central scar is typical for the larger oncocytic neoplasms, but that can also be seen in renal cell carcinomas. So it's not a diagnostic point. Uh, basically, radiology findings are not diagnostic, except we do have a new imaging test that we're using more often that seems to be very helpful in making these diagnoses, and I'll show you in a minute. But fine needle aspiration uh, often also is not diagnostic. There really is no 100% reliable uh, histologic marker of oncocytoma versus low-grade uh, like chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. So here are a couple examples. These are classic lesions which could be oncocytomas, but they could also be renal cell carcinomas, spherical, homogeneous, round masses with central stellate scar. This one is an oncocytoma. This one's a renal cell carcinoma. Absolutely no way to distinguish these two apart without biopsy or other imaging tests. So biopsy is helpful, but often not definitive. And usually we start, if we see a mass like that, with a biopsy, knowing that there's some substantial risk that they could be in an oncocytoma and not need to be resected. But now when we get that diagnosis, if it's not definitive for one or the other, get the diagnosis of oncocytic neoplasm, the urologists have started requesting a Sestamibi scan as a nuclear medicine scan that's been shown to be very reliable in distinguishing oncocytoma from renal cell carcinoma. The central scar is not reliable, although we used to think it was. So here's a couple of examples of Sestamibi scans. Oncocytomas take up the cestamibi, renal cell carcinomas don't. So here's a mass, it's kind of obscured by this big arrow, but there's a central stellate scar in it in the lower part of the left kidney. And this clearly takes up the cestamibi and this was proven to be an oncocytoma. Similarly, here's one, could be oncocytoma, could be renal cell carcinoma, cestamibi scan, no uptake, less than normal kidney means uh, negative. And this is diagnostic of a renal cell carcinoma, we believe. So we're finding this quite reliable so far, but we usually use it after a biopsy of an oncocytic neoplasm that is not definitive and use this as more evidence that it's in fact an oncocytoma or a renal cell carcinoma and then guide therapy based on that. Uh, oncocytic neoplasms, unfortunately, are fairly common, again, in that large series of masses that had biopsies before ablation, 9% of them were oncocytic neoplasms. So most of those were probably oncocytomas, although we don't know for sure. They were treated uh, because we couldn't tell. And there are such things as hybrid tumors where some component is oncocytoma and a different area of the tumor is a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. So the biopsy itself is not reliable based on that factor. Sestamibi scanning, which we're using more recently in the last couple of years, seems to be very promising to differentiate 
when we get the diagnosis of oncocytic neoplasm on biopsy, differentiate renal cell carcinoma from oncocytoma. And it may be useful before the biopsy, but right now we're using it after biopsy. So that all sounds perfect, except the reality is even with our most diligent efforts, about 10% or up to 20% of ball-shaped solid masses will end up being benign. Oncocytoma, again, I've explained ways where we can differentiate many of these, but they don't always get all these tests. Uh, angiomyelipomas without detectable fat, unless we do a biopsy, we will not make that diagnosis. And other very rare lesions, occasionally we're surprised we get a metastasis or a lymphoma that can mimic renal cell carcinoma. So here are three examples. All three of these are solid, enhancing, ball-shaped masses, no fat, not simple cysts. Now, this one is a little bit more dense than the kidney, so you might suspect maybe that's an angiomyelipoma, but again, we can't really tell. In fact, this one turns out to be a renal cell carcinoma, this one is an angiomyelipoma, and this one's an oncocytoma. But basically, by the parameters that we typically use, these all would be presumed to be renal cell carcinomas, unless we did a biopsy or surveillance imaging to see that they're stable. Okay, I'm gonna just touch briefly on what about these bean-shaped things? So lesions that don't deform the shape of the kidney are not exophytic, they grow along the normal architecture of the kidney. Well, if they arise in the renal parenchyma, uh, I'm sorry, if they arise in the renal sinus and invade the renal parenchyma, they're likely urothelial carcinomas that are arisen in calyx and the renal pelvis, uh, in the renal parenchyma or perinephric space lymphoma, sometimes aggressive subtypes of renal cell carcinoma will be infiltrating masses. Those are very difficult to make the diagnosis unless there is something specific about the patient or imaging features, which I'll show you some examples. Uh, the other things to consider, could it be a focal pyelonephritis? That's a mimicker, so like a young patient with a focal area with fever, with bacteria in the urine, and they have an area that looks like a mass in the kidney. Think about focal pylo, treat them with antibiotics, follow up tuberculosis, again, another type of infection. And then infarction, again, can be infiltrative lesion, usually low attenuation, wedge-shaped area. That's not usually a diagnostic dilemma. So once you've identified the shape, it's a bean, basically maintains the normal shape of the kidney. Look at the epicenter, again, renal sinus, urothelial carcinoma, parenchyma, think of these other lesions, lymphoma, the rare infiltrating renal cell carcinoma, METs, like uh, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, a ureteral bud neoplasm, uh, those like uh, renal medullary carcinomas can look like can be infiltrative lesions. So let's see how well this works. So here's a mass. The kidney has basically maintained its shape. It's not exophytic, maybe a little bit of swelling of this side. But where's the epicenter of this? Well, if you had to throw a dart, maybe right here. I think I put a dot in there. Oh, perfect. So the epicenter looks like it's in the renal sinus. So this should be a urothelial carcinoma. Again, we can't always tell. But when in doubt, if you think this is a urothelial carcinoma, try to get tissue. And in these cases, I would avoid doing a percutaneous biopsy because urothelial carcinomas do have a tendency to seed the biopsy tract. But on the other hand, these have to arise from the urothelium. So retrograde pyelogram, urine cytology, even just a, a CT urogram to see if the calyx looks normal, if it's pushed out of the way, but not a tumor arising from it, then it's less likely to be urothelial carcinoma you would consider biopsy. But this was a urothelial carcinoma. Similarly, here's a very homogeneous infiltrative mass. It doesn't look like an infarct. It's very homogeneous, doesn't look like infection. Where's the epicenter of this? Well, it's in the renal parenchyma. So in that case, we have to think about parenchyma lesion. This patient also has lymphadenopathy, has known lymphoma. This is a great look for lymphoma. And with lymphoma, there are multiple patterns. You can have a solitary mass like this. Sometimes the mass can be exophytic, although that's unusual. They're usually infiltrative. Or you can see multifocal infiltrative masses. And again, this could be confused for infarcts or infection, but this patient has known lymphoma. Here's an enlarged lymph node here, but there were others. And this is the most common appearance of lymphoma is multifocal infiltrating parenchymal masses in the kidney, the most common renal manifestation of lymphoma. You can also see lymphoma that invades the renal sinus, usually it's retroperitoneal disease, it enlarges and extends into the perinephric space or the renal sinus. This is a, a fairly common appearance for lymphoma. Perinephric disease is a common uh, location for lymphoma. And you have to think about other lymphoproliferative disorders like leukemia can look like this, amyloid can look like this. Again, there are other 
diseases, but lymphoma is probably the most common for these perinephric masses. Sometimes it can just be massive, diffuse enlargement of the kidney with diffuse infiltration. The kidneys don't function well, so we don't get contrast in these cases, but this can be very confusing, but this is one of the well-known appearances of renal lymphoma. Now here's a case where infiltrative mass, sort of ball shape, but really no deformity of the kidney. Uh, this uh, what could this be? Lymphoma, metastatic disease, aggressive renal cell carcinoma. This turned out to be an infiltrating renal cell carcinoma, the epicenter is in the renal parenchyma. Uh, in this case, this is a, a young patient, like 18 years old, um, had sickle cell trait, and that's a, should, an alarm bell should go off when you see aggressive tumor, early metastatic disease in lymph nodes. He also had metastatic disease in his chest. This is renal medullary carcinoma, which is uh, a form of urethral bud tumor that arises in the distal tubules of the kidney. These are very aggressive tumors and with very poor outcome. Some other features I want to mention. So I've shown you common features. And these are common but less well known, but very helpful in confirming the diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma. These are only seen with MRI, uh, particularly clear cell and papillary. And the MRI features often reinforce the diagnosis. So we know clear cell, you're experts on this. This is the most common subtype of renal cell carcinoma, it makes about 70% of renal cell carcinomas. And why do we call them clear cell? Well, because they have a lot of microscopic lipid in their cytoplasm. So they have a lot of cytoplasm and it's lipid laden. So that makes them hyperdense on T2, which we commonly see. They also have a lot of blood vessels, so they're very vascular. And these tend to be aggressive, large, heterogeneous. And if you see tumors that invade the renal vein, these are much more likely to be clear cell than any other subtype of renal cell carcinoma. So what about this microscopic fat? Well, what does that remind you of? reminds you of adrenal adenoma. So here's the histology slide off the internet of an adrenal adenoma, and here's a clear cell carcinoma. Both have abundant cytoplasm with lipid in the cytoplasm. And we can make the diagnosis of lipid in the cytoplasm and adenoma using in and out of phase imaging that cancels the signal where water and fat density are next to each other. So it's not macroscopic fat, but it's microscopic fat. And so we figured we might see that in clear cell carcinomas. Interestingly, a long time ago, one common synonym for renal cell carcinoma was hypernephroma, meaning, be, and that was called that because they looked like adrenal lesions because the, you can see the similarity histologically that these looked like under a microscope, hypernephromas. So here's a, a, some MRI images. This is the bottom of the left kidney, that little round part. This is all a large renal cell carcinoma. This is a in phase, it's called chemical shift imaging, where we, what we look for is intracellular lipid. So in phase, out of phase. And you can see this is about the same signal density as the normal kidney. But then we do out of phase imaging, large areas of this drop signal, lose signal. That's diagnostic of intracellular lipid. Well, what do you see intracellular lipid in? in the kidney, clear cell carcinomas. And after we give contrast, this is avidly enhances, uh, again, very vascular tumor, great findings for clear cell carcinoma, in phase, out of phase contrast. So here's another array, again, large tumor. This is not that subtle, enhances a lot, has necrosis. This is, looks good, the avid enhancement, that's great for renal cell carcinoma. Uh, it's sort of bright on T2, it's not dark, that's for sure. But look at the in and out of phase imaging. So here's in phase, here's out of phase. Clearly this drop signal here, it's about the same as the kidney. Here it's darker than the kidney. This says intracellular lipid, diagnostic of renal cell carcinoma. Here's a, a more recent case I saw in phase, out of phase, clearly drop signal. This is a small clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So how often do we see that? Well, we see it only about 40% of clear cell carcinomas. I don't know why we don't see it in more, but it's not that sensitive, but it is very specific with a 95% positive predictive value that when you see that finding, it's a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So very helpful, can really increase your confidence in making the diagnosis, not just renal cell carcinoma, in fact, it's clear cell. Whereas papillary, the second most common type, maybe up to 20% of renal cell carcinomas, unlike clear cell, which are hyper intense on T2, these are dark on T2, hypo intense. They don't enhance very avidly. They don't contain microscopic lipid but they often contain hemosiderin due to, I guess, subclinical bleeding 
deposit some iron in the cells in the tumors. Uh, these also restrict diffusion, although that's not an important feature. Remember, here's what a clear cell looks like. Here's a papillary, totally different. Again, these are densely packed cells, not a lot of cytoplasm, certainly no lipid in the cytoplasm, so we don't see that feature. So what do these look like? Largely dark on T2. Remember, the clear cell was bright, as bright as the kidney or brighter. They can be confused with cysts on T2 in some cases. Um, with contrast, this does in fact enhance, but not very much, not like as much as the kidney or more like we often see with clear cell. And what happens on in and out of phase? On clear cell, it drops signal on out of phase. Well, here we see the mass is about the same as kidney. On the out of phase, it's actually brighter than the kidney. So it's gained signal or it's dropped signal on the in phase. And this is diagnostic of hemosiderin, iron within the tumor. And that indicates it's highly likely to be papillary carcinoma, but even more importantly, I'll show you what's more important, even more importantly, because we saw this in about 43% of papillary and only about 18% of clear cells. So it can happen, can be seen, the hemosiderin in either of these tumors. But what was very important is we never saw hemosiderin in any benign tumors. So this is, if you see hemosiderin, probably papillary. Again, you want to look at the other features, but highly likely to be malignant. Again, renal cell carcinoma. I'm not meaning, I don't mean a metastasis of being malignant. This is a renal cell carcinoma. Finally, and I kind of put this in maybe out of, out of uh, order, but I think it was a good time to, to touch on this because we wanted to, I wanted to talk mostly about renal cell carcinoma. But there are some, quote, renal masses that you're not sure if they're renal or not, and that's really important. So here's a classic differential in radiology when we see a lesion like this. So obviously there's a lot of fat. There's something here, it's fat, but it's also got some soft tissue, strandy material in there. Here's with contrast. There's some large vessels in this, maybe even some aneurysms, and it's around the kidney, it touches the kidney, but is this a, a renal lesion or is it a perirenal lesion? Well, it's, this is not rocket science. So the way we tell is we look at every edge of the renal cortex. If there's no break in the renal cortex, it's perinephric. But in this case, although this is quite a large tumor, it does have a little root where it arose from the renal cortex. And that's all you need. And this is a pretty common appearance of an angiomyelopoma, where it, it's small, breaks out in the perinephric spaces, they're very soft. Again, they're made out of fat largely tumors, so they grow kind of like the cap of a mushroom. But this is a typical appearance, strandy fat. Again, once we know it arises from the kidney, no, there's, uh, it's not controversial what the diagnosis is. This is an angiomyelopoma. Alternatively, virtually identical appearance, that strandy, mostly fatty lesion, but with some soft tissue strands in it. Don't see any high hypervascularity, but on every edge of the kidney, there's no break in the cortex. This does not arise from the kidney, but it's right next to the kidney. This is in the perinephric space. So this, the cortex is intact. This is not an angiomyelopoma. They have to arise from the kidney. This is a liposarcoma. Again, remember things that arise outside in the perinephric space, they're usually or are often benign. Again, you can see sarcomas, you can, but more often than not, there'll be benign lesions like a lyomoma, but think mesenchymal tumors like lymphatic, so lymphoma, that's a, a reasonable lesion, uh, benign smooth muscle tumors, fibrous tumors, uh, fatty tumors, lipomas. And again, that will get you on the right track, but those usually need to biopsy. So some key take home points, Remember when imaging renal tumors, later phase on CT is very important. So if you have someone you're following up renal tumor, uh, syndromes with risk for renal tumor, hematuria, make sure that you get more than just the standard CT of the abdomen. So get a renal protocol CT or a CT urogram where we get multiple phases of contrast enhancement, including at least one phase more delayed than the corticomedullary phase, which is also known as the portal venous phase, to so you won't miss those small renal tumors. Uh, image guided biopsies often useful. We do quite a few renal mass biopsies to, again, help inform decisions about management, how aggressive the tumor is, make sure it's not an oncocytoma or other mimicker of renal cell carcinoma. 
If you see a homogeneous water density lesion, those can be ignored even if it's CT with contrast or CT without contrast. On non-contrast CT, this is non-contrast CT, lesions that are 20 to 70 Hounswood units are basically indeterminate, could be renal cell carcinomas, and they should get either follow-up or further imaging, ultrasound, MRI, or surveillance imaging. Fat-containing masses are all AMLs. Unless you see calcification, then you have to worry that it's, in fact, a rare renal cell carcinoma. If MRI shows intracellular lipid or hemosiderin, those are almost 100% renal cell carcinoma. So far, in my experience, 100%. Uh, this is what San Francisco used to look like. It still looks like this, but we don't see any cruise ships anymore in this COVID era. But thank you very much for your attention. I have one more slide to show you, and uh, uh, you can email me questions. Or Again, I appreciate your attention to this lecture, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, this is given by the urology department, and this is for the survey. Please use this with your smartphone to complete the survey. Thank you.